Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a new book called Abolishing the Military, Arguments and Alternatives, with two of the three authors joining us from New Zealand. This being the New Zealand military in particular that they would like to abolish. I, of course, want to abolish everybody's militaries. With us is Joseph Llewellyn, who completed his PhD at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Otago. He completed a Master's of Arts and a Postgraduate Diploma in Peace and Conflict Studies at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. Also with us is Richard Jackson, who holds the Leading Thinkers Chair in Peace Studies at the University of Otago. He lectures on critical terrorism studies and critical peace studies at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. I like saying that so many times, I wish we had one. He is the author or editor of 15 books and more than 100 articles and book chapters on pacifism and nonviolence, conflict resolution, war and terrorism. And he is the editor of the journal Critical Studies on Terrorism and commentates regularly in the media on international security issues. Joseph Llewellyn and Richard Jackson, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing the terrific book. Um, Whichever of you would like to start, why would New Zealand abolish its wonderful military? Take it away, Joe. Um, I think there's lots of reasons why we might abolish our military. I think maybe let's start by just talking a little bit about why we, um, we specifically wanted to write this book, is that I think... New Zealand, there's not a lot of conversation about what our military does, how it's funded, um, its actions around the world. There's very little critique on that. So we wanted to bring a bit of a critical eye to what our military is doing, how much it's costing us and what the reality of its actions actually are, um, which are, you know, the the violent effects of war around the world. Um, So we wanted to critique that and open a bit of a conversation about what our military actually does, whether its actions actually contribute to global security or whether they really can make us more insecure. And if it's the case that that we're making it more insecure, what could we do with that money that would be a better alternative? It's it's amazing to me how many people study and teach something they call peace studies and never ask those questions. I, I think they are very good questions. Uh, Richard, uh, what did you what did you find? Well, look, I just wanted to add, based on your your previous comment there, Please. I think I think you're right that um, you know the military is assumed by our society uh, to be a natural and sort of normal part of it, um, and for the most part, it remains unquestioned. And New Zealand has a very strong and long and and good peace tradition, which goes back to colonial times when um, indigenous Maori people resisted colonialism nonviolently, but it also uh, expressed itself in the conscientious objector movement, but also later on the world famous anti-nuclear movement. But almost nowhere in this tradition, um, apart from a small bit of time, um, you know, I think in the in the late 1800s, did anyone argue or talk about the military and abolishing the military? And it's become so normalized that this is this is part of what we wanted to do, because, as you say, even peace studies scholars uh, don't often focus on on anti-militarism. And in fact, they kind of assume that the military is this neutral actor that could be used for good. And, and so a lot of our courses in peace studies even talk about um, uh, peacekeeping and security sector reform and helping, you know, post-conflict states get a more professional military and so on and so forth without really, yeah, questioning whether this particular institution and the kind of long-term effects that it has uh, are actually antithetical to peace. Uh, in and of themselves, and whether they actually ought to be part of society. So, so part of what we wanted to do was to, 
to throw that fundamental question out there and try to get people thinking and talking about, well, hey, yeah, let's let, do we really need a military? The, the War Department has, of course, been called the Defense Department, as everywhere else on the globe. But who do people think is trying to attack and invade and occupy and take over and limit the freedoms of New Zealand? I think that's a really good, good question. And in fact, we've got some quotes in the book where our own heads of our Defense Department say that one of their key threats to the Defense Department going forward is that there are no threats to New Zealand. Um, so really, without a really significant shift in the global political situation, there are no, no military threats to New Zealand. Um, and if there were, I think even with our per capita very high amount of military spending, the reality is for a, um, an invading force to come all the way to New Zealand and successfully invade, they would need such great resources and military power that the military we have realistically we don't think we'd be able to defend against that. Um, so we don't think it's a realistic way of, of saying how we would defend against a military threat. So there's no threat. And if there were, the military couldn't defend against it. What's the military for? Well, th this is the question that, that we pose. This, um, you know, because the common understanding is that we have a military because we need it for national defense. But then we point out that actually it couldn't do that anyway and there is really no real threat so then when we probe a little deeper what we find is that i mean first of all historically the, the new zealand military was used um by the, the settlers to dispossess the indigenous people uh, and fight a series of wars to to create space for um for settlers and then later on it becomes used um uh, to help the the imperial British power uh, fight its wars overseas. And then later on, of course, um, uh, New Zealand gets drawn into various wars by the great, the great powers, Britain and, and America. And mostly that, that's what we do. And then, and then also a little bit of uh, peacekeeping as well. So yes, when we examine this, uh, kind of myth that New Zealand's military is there for national defense, we find actually it's there for a particular kind of foreign policy, a foreign policy that supports Britain and the United States and what we call the Anglophone uh, Alliance, you know, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand as well. I mean, pretty much all the, the British imperial powers and then the British uh, former settler colonial states and this is this is our broader group of international friends, and we go off and fight with them all the time. Uh, and we even, you know, make our military train it and equip it for what's called interoperability, which is the ability to operate, um, you know, closely and seamlessly with though the the military of of those countries as well. So, I mean, we think this is an important point because it's not really often acknowledged in in, in our public debate, at least, that, that our military has not only just this, this difficult history in terms of coloniality and, and settler violence against the indigenous people, but also its role in kind of helping, yeah, what we might call global imperialism uh, and, and yeah. fighting together with, with other big powers around the world. It seems like joining in U.S.-led wars in the Middle East is the opposite of defense. If anything, it could generate uh, antagonisms rather than uh, resolve them. Uh, so you'd need some sort of argument that it was not a defense department, but a philanthropic world benefiting organization that these wars were doing some sort of good for the world. Um, they make that argument in the United States. They tell us that the wars are benefiting the world and the world's too stupid to appreciate them. Uh, do they make that argument in, in New Zealand? Do you want to answer, Joe? Um, I guess, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sitting in the US. I think they do, they do make that argument, absolutely. I also think there's been less pressure on the New Zealand government internally to justify its actions. So for a long time, I think the, uh, the discourse coming out of the New Zealand government is that we're, you know, our military engages in peacekeeping, we're doing developments, we'll talk about, um, there are lots of instances of talking about the war in Afghanistan, for example, 
as if we were there peacekeeping, whereas really we were sending SAS troops, which are basically kill squads, to go and um, act in Afghanistan. And apart from a couple of journalists, there's been very, very few people really pulling up that, hey, the SAS is not a peacekeeping force. Um, so I think there's been very little critique really over for a long time here over what our military is actually doing and what it's actually engaged in. I, yeah, what, one, of, one of the one of the um, the sort of common narratives, if you like, national narrative that we have, is that um, New Zealand is, uh, and I quote, a good international citizen. In other words, it responds to calls by the international community to support peace support operations, but it also responds to calls from our close allies, the good countries of the United States and Britain to go and, and deal with security issues like as occurred during the war on terror. And and we need the military to be a good international uh, citizen. You know, we need the military to be able to pull our weight in helping the world deal with threats and things. And so in the book, one of the things that we do is, is, is put that claim uh, to, to close scrutiny and, and try to see, well, did any of our peace support operations or peacekeeping uh, contributions really help to create international peace and security? And in particular, did our involvement in the war on terror, all those different Middle East operations and Afghanistan and elsewhere, did they really help to, to create more international security? And I think, you know, counterintuitively to the common sense of our society, we come up by saying, well, actually, I don't think New Zealand has really made much of a contribution. And like you say, we've probably actually made things worse. We've, we've, we've deepened, helped to deepen international insecurity uh, and create more threats. And, and really, the, the military is not doing uh, its role. And in fact, the interesting thing is that there's one case, uh, which is New Zealand's involvement in Bougainville in Papua New Guinea, uh, which did help to create a, a peaceful transition over there, but it did so with unarmed peacekeepers. They deliberately decided to go there and be keep peacekeepers and didn't take any weapons. They took guitars and things like that instead, and they, they engaged with people. And so, you know, one of the arguments we make is that um, perhaps the New Zealand military could transition to an unarmed peacekeeping force um, because, you know, one of our key successes is this, this case that we hold up. Um, and, and certainly the military interventions we're engaged in have not actually helped to create global peace and security. In fact, the armed peacekeeping missions of the United Nations often make things worse. Um, the, the story of this unarmed peacekeeping mission in Bougainville um, is in a movie, I think, called something like Soldiers Without Guns. Uh, that's, that's just a wonderful story. I understand people in the United States not knowing about it. Uh, you know, they don't, we don't want movies if there's not a lot of explosions in the movies. But uh, why isn't New Zealand learning from its own lesson and saying to the United Nations, why not do the less expensive, more effective, less counterproductive, actually peaceful approach to peacekeeping? Why would New Zealand learn that lesson and then not learn the lesson? Joe? Absolutely. I think that's our, our argument and it completely is that we should be learning from these things. And New Zealand's got, as Richard said, we've got strong peace traditions in various various times over New Zealand's history. And we should be learning from those and promoting those. Um, unfortunately, I think especially probably this century, there's been a, a bit more of a shift towards um, talking about the military, shifting away from peacekeeping, investing more in um, weapons our military spending has been going up quite steadily for the last decade um mm -hmm. so we're really wanting to bring that to people's you know the forefront of people's mind those those interchangeable weapons those u.s made weapons <laughs> that the u.s military can send people to help use those weapons uh yeah um, we're, we're speaking with with joseph llewellyn and richard jackson and the book which i highly recommend is called abolishing the military arguments and alternatives, it seems like the other thing that the New Zealand military claims to do, as do they all, 
is humanitarian aid work, but it also seems like you'd be better off with people trained in humanitarian aid work with without the weapons, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I think that's a, a really key argument. If you look at, um, well, partly we've, we've got the idea here that people in New Zealand think that we're engaging in peaceful, peaceful missions and peacekeeping and things like that, and that we do humanitarian aid. And then when you look at what we're spending our money on, it's on technology and training that are purely designed to harm and kill other human beings. Um, so one of our arguments is that if, you know, if we want to be more peaceful, we could take probably a fraction of that military spending and invest it in technology and training that's designed to, to help people, doctors, nurses, um, equipment for helping in disasters. So for example, well, you know, we're a country with lots of potential for lots of earthquakes and things like that. We could have equipment that's specifically designed to help in those situations rather than relying on military technology that, that we then try and co-opt in disaster situations. Yeah. Yeah. What one one of the one of the things we point out is that um uh it is a common belief in New Zealand that we need a military for disaster relief, but the the reality is that the military don't train for disaster relief, they train for combat. That's their primary goal. And then if they're out on deployment when a disaster hits, then they're not going to be available to uh, help in a disaster anyway. Um, so as Joe said, it would be much, much more efficient and much more logical if we actually had specially trained and equipped disaster uh, relief support services, right? Um, why do they need to train how to kill people in order to be able to save people from, from natural disasters? Um, so, and I think these are, these are just sort of like common sense points that you'd think would be part of the debate and part of um, the, the, the conversation. But in New Zealand, uh, yeah, they, they're almost never heard. And I think that's because the, you know, there is this strong current in our politics and in our culture and history that, uh, yeah, no, we need to join the big boys at the big table with our own military and, you know, we'll be left out, we'll be a, a small player with no significance if we don't um, participate in these things. And if we don't help our sort of historic allies, you know, particularly Britain, who, um, you know, is our imperial uh, father, as it were. Um, but people don't realize that all of this kind of goes against um, our other stated desire, which is to have an independent and principled foreign policy, which is, you know, a set of terms that you hear a lot uh, from, from politicians. Hmm. I wish I heard them more and I wish they meant them. I, I, I guess they, I guess they're trying to be proactive, right? Somebody has got to create the disasters. You can't just go around responding to disasters. Um, but I, I think the, I think the book makes a, makes a strong argument, uh, and, and cites documentation and studies that, that the wars hardly ever work on their own terms, uh, that, military repression of uh, of problems rarely works on its own terms, that non-state terrorism rarely works on its own terms, and that, as we've mentioned, non-violent tools can work better. Um, all of this and most of your arguments seem to me to apply to the whole darn planet. Um, what is, how much of your argument is New Zealand specific? Um, or, or put otherwise, which which countries do you think shouldn't abolish their militaries? That's a good, good question. I, speaking for myself, I think we should be working for military abolition everywhere. Um, I think the, the book is targeted at, at New Zealand. And with that, as you say, I think maybe 80% of our arguments are very, it's very universal in terms of the nature of the military, what, the, what's, what military technology actually does, its effects on the world. Um, there are a few arguments in there that are quite New Zealand specific. I think as a small, a small state in the Pacific, quite isolated from elsewhere, um, that probably speak to countries of a similar size. Um, we know that countries like, for example, Costa Rica, which has a similar, similar population, doesn't have a military. Um, I think there's there's some leverage there internally in New Zealand to go, you know, even if you believe that having a military was the right thing to do and was needed, 
we're never, even with our high military spending, going to be able to achieve the things that um, people advocating for the military are claiming we need. So at the moment, I think there's only 22 countries that are spending more on us per capita on their military, which is for a country of 5 million, it's quite a lot of spending really. There's no other comparative country of the same size with the same population that's spending as much as us. Yeah. And you also in the book uh, get to some of the alternatives, including unarmed civilian defense, um, which most people I'm afraid uh, will never know what it is unless we figure out some way to tell them. Uh, and moving, as you've mentioned, moving some of the money to more useful things. Can you talk about what some of those alternatives would be? Yeah, look, I mean, in the academic field, there there is a, a sort of quite a strong literature on this. Um, and also, I'm sure as you know, historically, there are a lot of um, cases, but they just don't get the, um, the publicity and the and the kind of write up that that um, military defense does. I mean, partly here we're talking about um, the power of the the broader militaristic cultures that we all live in, where the military is um, you know given huge resources, but also huge kudos and. Uh, movies are made about them and television shows and books and so on so that we all think that you know it's kind of heroic and it's all glorious and um you know there's that famous book war war is the force that gives us meaning um chris hedges book um you know militarism and war has become part of our cultural dna if you like so the the idea that you could actually defend a country through nonviolent resistance and non-cooperation um, seems nonsensical and it seems uh, illogical and and uh, it seems like impossible. But in fact, we there are so many great cases of where it's happened. And countries like Lithuania, for example, and the other Baltic states that you know are right there on the border with Russia, and they had thousands of Russian troops and tanks in there occupying them and they managed to kind of kick them out uh, and resist their attempts to take over their countries through nonviolent resistance i mean kind of shows you that it it is possible right it can happen um and then there are other cases which obviously took a lot longer but through nonviolent resistance you know east germany was able to eventually tear down the wall and 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 get rid of their um, communist dictatorship as well. So these stories need to be told and they need to be put out there, but they also need to be uh, more rigorously studied um, and developed so that we can actually come up with the kind of tools uh, that we, we might actually be able to use in a practical situation. And I think there is a literature out there, but yeah, the, this is the 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 problem that we face and perhaps this is you know why you exist and why your radio show exists to try and get some of this out there and get it into consciousness so that people will genuinely start thinking about it i mean interestingly in new zealand one or two political parties have at times kind of mentioned the idea and at least considered its possibility uh joe could probably tell you a bit more about this uh, in terms of like the green party um, but at, at the political level, it's very, very rare to hear it, even though there are countries, like I mentioned, Lithuania, where they put it into their constitution that um, they are going to uh, use uh, social defense or nonviolent uh, civilian-based defense uh, if Russia should ever invade them again. I'm afraid they've somewhat subordinated that plan to their own military, but I hope I'm wrong about that. Um, I encourage people to look at the list of successful unarmed resistance to wars and occupations uh, at worldbeyondwar.org slash list. Um, but uh, Joseph, we have just a few minutes left. If, if contrary to all likelihood, somebody were to invade and occupy New Zealand, what, what would people be able to do uh, that a military would not? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, 
I think the basic idea when we're talking about civilian-based defense is that it's a really, in arguably, especially here, it's more of a deterrent. If, if an evading force comes in and it knows that the population that it's trying to control is uncontrollable or has methods to stop that. So if we had ways of blocking our roads, blocking our runways, blocking um, military communication, um, if we had ways of decentralizing power and food sources so that an occupied force can't come and take it in um, and control that those things, it gets very difficult to get the population to do what you want when you're on the ground. Um, and I think like a, like a government with its own population, an uh, evading force coming in still needs people to do the things in society to, for it to be able to leverage what it wants out of an occupation. So there's a lot more, we would argue a lot more potential there for us to do all sorts of destructive things and then set society up in a way that might actually be supportive, not in an evasion, for example, if we had um, more food available in local communities and things like that. Um, that's much more of a deterrence if that's planned um, than say our few Navy ships and our few Air Force planes. Am I, am I right? Has anyone suspected or done any studies of the obvious uh, suspicion that the reason governments won't train their people in unarmed resistance to a foreign invasion is that then those governments are themselves unable to impose anything unpopular on their own populations? Don't, don't have evidence for that, but I think that's very true. If populations are trained in civilian-based defense, then they're you know, they can leverage their own power in various situations, which it's, I'd argue is a good thing. But, it's um, not it, It's yeah. not because it doesn't work, right? That's not why governments don't use it, right? Absolutely. No, it's because it does work. I mean, the fact that, you know, um, as we've seen around the world in numerous situations, including recently, when populations decide to disobey their leaders, um, yeah, there's there's very little leaders can do. So, it's never in the interests of existing political elites to empower the citizenry to the point where they are they're kind of autonomous and independent and they can resist attempts to coerce them. Uh, so you're absolutely right. I mean, Brian Martin makes this point clearly that he thinks that uh, uh, a key reason why um, social defense has not been pursued more rigorously is because elites are are worried that they would not then be able to control their own populations. So in, in this sense, you know, social defense and demilitarization and so on, it is not just about issues of national defense, but it's about issues of genuine democracy and freedom and autonomy for average citizens. And, and that's something I think we should all be working towards. Could not agree more. Much better than having wars in the name of democracy. We've been speaking with Joseph Llewellyn and Richard Jackson. Uh, I cannot recommend the book highly enough. It is called Abolishing the Military, Arguments and Alternatives. Uh, Joseph and Richard, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.